There will be four free response questions on the AP Pre-Calculus exam. This video is modeled after FRQ3. It's about sinusoidal modeling, which means using a sine function or a cosine function to model a real-world situation. Let's pretend this is from the 2005 AP Pre-Calculus exam. If you appreciate the content, please give it a like. The figure shows a man running inside a giant hamster wheel with an outer diameter of 8 feet. As the man runs, the wheel rotates in a clockwise direction, completing two rotations every second. At time t equals 0 seconds, point S is located directly above the center of the hamster wheel, 2 feet from the ceiling above the hamster wheel. As the man runs inside the hamster wheel, the distance between S and the ceiling periodically increases and decreases. The sinusoidal function h models the distance between s and the ceiling in feet as a function of time t in seconds. Part a. The graph of h and its dashed midline for two full cycles is shown. Five points f, g, j, k, and p are labeled on the graph. No scale is indicated and no axes are presented. Determine possible coordinates t, h of t for the five points f, g, j, k, and p. Let's begin by finding the three values on a vertical scale where h of t has highest value, lowest value, and middle value. h of t represents the distance between point s and the ceiling. The smallest distance between s and the ceiling is when s is at the top of the hamster wheel and we are told that is two feet from the ceiling above the hamster wheel. So two feet is the smallest value for h of t. Therefore, we will label this lower value on the vertical scale with a two. Point S will be farthest from the ceiling when it rotates around to the bottom of the hamster wheel. We are told that the diameter of the hamster wheel is eight feet. So when point S is at the bottom of the hamster wheel, it will be 8 plus 2 feet from the ceiling. In other words, point S will be 10 feet from the ceiling at its greatest distance. And that's why we will label the upper mark on the vertical scale with a 10. How about the middle value? That will simply be the average of the high and low. So we simply add the high and low and divide by 2. 10 plus 2 divided by 2. That's 12 divided by 2, which is 6. So now we know all of the output values of the five points. Next, we need to label the input values on a horizontal scale. Always start with time t equals 0. We are told that at t equals 0 seconds, Point S is located directly above the center of the hamster wheel, two feet from the ceiling. In other words, at T equals zero, S is at its closest distance to the ceiling. Since the distance from the ceiling is two at time T equals zero, we need to pick a point on the graph at an output value of two and call it T equals zero. For example, we could designate this input value at point j as t equals 0. However, if we do that, the input values to the left will be negative. There's nothing wrong with that, but that is not what I prefer to do. Instead, I recommend extending the graph to the next minimum output value, which is one quarter of a period to the left. Let's designate this input value as time t equals 0. In order to find the other input values, we need to find the period of h of t, which is the duration of a single cycle. We are told that the wheel completes two rotations every second. If two rotations equal one second, we can find the duration of one rotation by dividing both sides of this equation by two. We get one rotation is equal to one half of a second. This is the period, which I'm going to call P. If one rotation takes a half of a second, 
It will take one half of a second to go from the starting position two feet from the ceiling, move further away, and then return back to the starting position two feet from the ceiling. Looking at the graph, we are saying that it will take one half of a second to go from the starting position two feet from the ceiling, go further away, and then return to the starting position again. In other words, point J should be at one half of a second. If we take half of the period, it will give us this middle input value. Of course, half of a half is one-fourth. If we take half of one-fourth, it'll give us the last input value. And one-half of one-fourth is one-eighth. You can use the first input value after zero to find any remaining input values because they will all be multiples of the first. In other words, this first mark is one-eighth. Uh, the next input value was two-eighths, which reduces to one-fourth. The next input value will be three-eighths. The next one is four-eighths, which reduces to one-half. The next input will be five-eighths, and the last input value will be six eighths. So it's just a matter of reducing the ones you can. So again, this input value is three eighths. This input value right here is five eighths. And six eighths reduces to three fourths. At this moment, we have all of the input values and all of the output values for the five points. We just need to list out the coordinates. So for example, point F is at one fourth comma 10. Point G is at three eighths comma six. Point J is at one half comma two. Point K is at five eighths comma six. And point P is at three fourths comma ten. And that's it for part A. Part B, the function h can be written in the form h of t is equal to a times the cosine of b times t plus c plus d. Find the values of the constants a, b, c, and d. I want you to memorize that the parent function y equals sine t looks like this. It starts at the midline and then it rises and falls and returns to the midline. Please memorize that the parent function y equals cosine t starts at its highest value and it falls and then rises back to its highest value. We notice that h of t is a transformation of the cosine function. So let's trace one period of the cosine function on the graph of h of t. So I'm going to trace a portion of the graph that starts at its highest value, falls and returns to its highest value again. Let's build a model for h of t, filling in the values of a, b, c, and d as we go by comparing h of t to the parent function and looking for the transformations. So the a value represents a vertical dilation. Looking at the parent function, we see that the distance between the midline and the highest value is one. Now, let's look at that same distance on the graph of h of t. What is the distance between the midline and the highest value? This distance of four is called the amplitude, and it is also the value of a. Now let's find the b value. I want you to memorize this formula. The period for both sine and cosine will always be two pi divided by whatever this b value is. 
Solving this equation for b gives b is equal to two pi divided by the period. We will use this version of the formula to find the value of b. So b is going to equal two pi divided by the period. We discovered that the period was one half of a second. So b will be two pi divided by one half. When you divide by a fraction, you multiply by the reciprocal. So this will be two pi times two, which is equal to four pi. So that is the value of b. The c value corresponds to a horizontal translation compared to the parent function, but it will always be the opposite of what appears on the graph. Notice that the parent function starts right at zero. This period of the cosine function that we are focusing on begins at one-fourth instead of zero. This means compared to the parent function, we are looking at a horizontal translation of one-fourth. This will show up as a minus one-fourth inside the equation. In the context of periodic functions, a horizontal translation is known as a phase shift. The d value reflects a vertical translation compared to the parent function. Let's focus on the midline. The midline of the parent function is right at zero. Notice that the midline for h of t is at six. Compared to the parent function, we are looking at a vertical translation by six. So the d value will be six. The d value will always be just the midline. In summary, we found that a is equal to four, b equals four pi, c equals negative one-fourth, and d equals six. Part C, refer to the graph of h in part A. The t coordinate of f is t1, and the t coordinate of g is t2. In other words, this is t1, and this is t2. C part one, on the interval from t1 to t2, which of the following is true about h? Is h positive and increasing, positive and decreasing, negative and increasing, or negative and decreasing? From left to right along this interval, h is clearly decreasing. h is also positive on this interval because look at these output values. They are all between positive six and positive 10. So h of t is positive and decreasing on this interval. So the answer is b. C part two, describe how the rate of change of h is changing on the interval from t1 to t2. In unit one, we learned that wherever h of t is concave up, the rate of change of h of t is increasing. And wherever h of t is concave down, the rate of change of h of t is decreasing. On the interval from t1 to t2, h of t is concave down. So the rate of change of h of t is decreasing. That's how the rate of change of h is changing on the interval from t1 to t2. It's probably safest just to answer with a single word. Just say decreasing. Hey guys, don't forget to like and subscribe, but also if you found this video helpful, there's a lot more where that came from. You can click the upper link, which will take you to the whole unit playlist, or you can click the lower link, which will take you to the next video in the playlist. See you there.